Like a demon on a pogo stick, Blood on the Clock Tower has bounced to the number one spot on the Board Game Geek list of top party games. Toppling giants like Codenames, The Crypto, Jenga. Tons of people are drawn to the concept of social deduction games, like Werewolf and Mafia, and their many, many botched offspring. However, the excitement often fizzles once the game starts, plagued by issues like player elimination, the flatness of being a nondescript villager, a lack of meaningful information, a dull administrator role, and seemingly endless gameplay. This dichotomy is unfortunate. The idea, the fundamental idea of Werewolf is enthralling, yet the gameplay is often better left alone. Enter Blood on the Clock Tower, hyped as the peak of social deduction games, and having just recently hit the number one spot on BGG top party game list. Tries its best to refine the genre, it focuses on amplifying the strengths, while mitigating the typical frustrations. In Blood on the Clock Tower, generic roles are a thing of the past. Death often propels people forward, and the administrator is reimagined as a dynamic storyteller, weaving a tapestry of truths and falsehoods. The game promises a unique and substantial puzzle, but does it deliver? Is it the demon king of social deduction it aims to be, or merely a repackaged version of Werewolf? If you're familiar with social deduction games like Mafia or Werewolf, the bones of Blood on the Clock Tower will show clear lineage. It features the same standard day phase for deliberation and execution, a night phase where characters use their abilities and a game administrator to ensure smooth progression. However, it's the many additions, almost like the house rules, where Blood on the Clock Tower differentiates itself. The game's first departure lies in its scripts. These scripts used by the storyteller, who's the game's administrator. There is a division of roles into four categories. The townsfolk, who are good players with helpful abilities. Outsiders, who are good players with detrimental effects. Minions, who are the demon's allies who have disruptive powers. And of course, the demon themselves, focused on killing each player at nighttime. Each script comprises a mix of these roles, and before the game starts, the storyteller selects, with intention, what roles will be in the game, and then distribute these roles randomly to players. In a way, the script is the recipe, and the storyteller is the chef, deciding the game's flavor. And initially, I had reservations about these scripts. I was concerned that a poorly chosen combination of roles might ruin a game's quality. What if certain characters, like the investigator or the fortune teller, were essential for an engaging game? What would be the optimal recipe for each of these scripts? However, after many games, I find this was not really a problem. The scripts are so well balanced that any combination seems to work harmoniously, creating a versatile and engaging experience. Yes, there are clear differences in some games with some roles over others, but it's a large part of the fun trying to decipher how a certain mix of characters may change the flow of the game. And a significant strength of these scripts is on the emphasis of roles not in play. For example, in the Bad Moon Rising script, an execution resulting in no deaths sparked speculation among players. Could it have been the fool, the tea lady, the pacifist, or the devil's advocate? The mere possibility of certain roles being in play adds layers to the game, allowing for believable bluffs, clever misdirection, and a deeply satisfying puzzle. In other words, what characters are not in the game is a big part of the puzzle, and allows for these clever bluffs from all players, good and bad. However, the scripts are not without their limitations. Their effectiveness really shines with a high player count. With only 7 players, the games can feel limited, as only a fraction of the possible roles come into play. In contrast, with about 10 or more players, I find that each script has ample room to show you what it's got, enriching the puzzle and overall experience. Since the dynamics of the game and the roles are more complex than a simple one-to-one -one relationship, meaning that in smaller groups each role can feel slightly underutilized. The game thrives with a larger group, creating a more vibrant village atmosphere, and fostering natural, engaging discussions. 
The roles in Blood and the Clock Tower might initially seem like a shopping list for your schizophrenic grandma, but no, thanks to the incredibly well-designed unique roles, each player has a unique function. They're not your average villager A or villager B, we're talking about characters with the potential for Oscar-worthy performances in your living room. It goes to the point where each character has a pretty detailed wiki page about how to play them, how to fight them, but also how to bluff as that character. Diving into the townsfolk, we find 13 possible characters in each of the scripts. And let's break it down. In a 15 player game, the max amount of players before travelers come into play, you've got 9 townsfolk and 4 players on the evil side. This setup is a strategic goldmine. Why? Because it gives each minions and a demon characters a chance to masquerade as one of the four remaining out of the 13 townsfolk roles. And the beauty of that is that they can do it without any overlap. It's kind of like a game of high stakes musical chairs, where evil players are trying to grab a seat without sitting on anyone else's role. This element keeps the aura of believability to the evil players, and also ensures a dynamic game of who's who. In Trouble Bruin, the starting script, the roles are cleverly designed to drip feed crucial information to the good team, balancing initial insight with a steady flow of intel and protective measures. Take the chef for instance. Right from the start, they have knowledge of how many pairs of evil players are cozily seated next to each other. Similarly, the washerwoman gets a head start with a clue about one of the two players being a specific townsfolk. But the information doesn't stop at the first night. For example, each night the empath gains insight on how many of their living neighbors harbor evil intentions. For this reason, the empath makes an excellent target for the monk whose nightly mission is to shield key players from the demon's grubby hands. On the other hand, the demon and his minions have methods for elongating and providing misinformation to good players. For brand new players, I almost always will add on the Scarlet Woman because it ensures that if the demon is caught early on, there's a transfer of possession to the Scarlet Woman who can continue the game, kinda like an overly eager understudy after the demon forgets his lines and gets killed early. Now of all the roles in Trouble Brewing, I think my favorite is the Virgin. This role immediately executes the townsfolk if they nominate the Virgin player. It's kind of like role playing as a lie detector test. Some virgins wait until they are nominated, then if the player doesn't die, the virgin can reveal themselves and state that the nominator is not a townsfolk. Or the virgin can verify the truth of someone claiming to be the investigator or a slayer who already used his or her power. Having the power to completely validate someone is an incredibly powerful ability, but there are caveats for misinformation. For example, you might have been the drunk the whole time, which is also a huge fan favorite role. Or you may have been poisoned, or the spy actually nominated you and registered as a townsfolk. That said, it is important to know all of these caveats are actual game mechanics and not done by the will of a lone storyteller. In Blood in the Clock Tower, every role is a jigsaw puzzle with a personality. And with 22 unique roles just in the beginner script, the game becomes a fiesta of wild and wacky possibilities. It's kind of like a game show where every contestant is both the prankster and the one being pranked. Now in the core game, there are two other full scripts with an entirely unique set of roles that aren't shared between any other scripts. Which means that while some of the mechanics of the game stay the same, each role is completely unique per script. I can talk for hours about the strategies and relationships for each of these scripts, but I'd like to just highlight a few of my favorite roles in each. In Bad Moon Rising, it's all about uncertainty. This player live because the tea lady brewed them something good? Are they the fool and blissfully unaware of their own death? Or is the devil's advocate working overtime? Did someone revive because of the professor? Or is the Shabaloth in play? There's a lot of yes, but maybe this instead. And it is definitely the most ambiguous of the three scripts. Now, some favorites of Bad Moon Rising, the lunatic. The lunatic is like the person who walks into a surprise party and somehow ends up convinced it's for them. They're with the good guys, but in their head, they're the demon. The actual demon knows what they're up to, playing along with their imaginary kills, until suddenly it's all not making any sense to them. It's like watching someone dance to music only they can hear, but everyone's too polite to say anything. Another excellent role in Bad Moon Rising is the gossip. Basically, the gossip is the town's rumor mill. They make a public statement, could really be anything, 
And if it's true, the storyteller kills someone in the night. It's fun having the gossip stand up, make a little announcement, and then see the repercussions. This role can toss out massive clues to the team. Picture the gossip casually saying, the demon is one of those three sitting on the couch, or all the players wearing glasses are good. And if they're right, in the middle of the night brings an unexpected death, but hopefully a ton of information. But here is the kicker. Bad Moon Rising loves uncertainty. Sometimes you think you nailed the truth, but it's all just a rumor. For example, the assassin decided to get busy the same night as a false gossip statement. This leads to an extra kill, which could be misconstrued as a truthful gossip. Now you're left scratching your head, trying to figure out if your gossip statement was true, or you just stumbled upon someone else's dirty work. The gossip perfectly bleeds into the uncertainty of Bad Moon Rising. The final base script, Sex and Violets, which is like an orgy of information. It's a feast of clues with demons often best concealed by their strong minions. The script has the most powerful roles in the game and some of my favorites. First up, the savant. This role is like playing a game of two truths and a lie with the storyteller. Except, you know, it's one truth and one lie. The savant gets a mixed bag of info, one part fact, one part fiction. It's a balancing act that hands power to both the player and the storyteller. But it's also a super fun bluff. An evil player pretending to be the savant doling out clues that are about as reliable as a yaoi fan dub, perfectly framing someone else in the process. Then there's the Serenovis, which is from the evil lineup, a role that infiltrates with a powerful status called madness. For example, the Serenovis can make the oracle act like the klutz. It's like forcing a secret agent to play the role of a clown at a birthday party. The oracle's valuable intel gets buried under an act so convincing, even they might start believing they're the klutz. It's a mix of hilarious and strategic gameplay that feels just right in the high-powered world of sex and violets. Each script in Blood on the Clock Tower is excellent in its own right, but I'll emphasize, start with trouble brewing. You can't bluff if you don't understand the game. In actuality, I would rate the scripts as follows. Trouble brewing, complexity, 3 out of 10, fun, 9 out of 10. Bad Moon Rising, complexity, 6 out of 10, fun, 8 out of 10. Sex and Violets, complexity, 8 out of 10, fun, 9.5 out of 10. So Blood in the Clock Tower says see you later to the miserable role of the administrator in Werewolf. Instead, they introduce the storyteller, not just a game master, but the first casualty, who then gets to cook the chaos. The storyteller starts with the grimoire, which is, quite fittingly, the game box itself. Premium cardboard box, it's built tough, it has felt lining that grips the game pieces like Harambe did to that kid in his enclosure, and overall looks amazing. Now the storyteller isn't there just to look spooky though. They have a hand in how the game unfolds, such as whispering directly to certain players like the savant, or deciding which clue to give the investigator. But let's be clear, the storyteller isn't some rule-bending cosmic giga chad. They can't just decide to throw a player curveball just for funsies. No, for any to happen, it's got to be by the book. Like someone being poisoned or stumbling around drunk, it must be thanks to in-game mechanics. And here's where it gets interesting. The storyteller does make game-altering decisions, but I've always supported one golden rule. Always, always root for the underdog. The game hits its climax when it reaches that thigh-crushing final day. Any storyteller who messes with that for their own amusement or bias is a gains goblin of fun. And those storytellers who love the sound of their own voice giving away tips or strategies, no, just stop it. Don't be masturbatory, don't go forever. I've learned to appreciate the quiet and subtle storytellers far more than those who think themselves more entertaining than the game dynamics. If a player, say the Slayer, tries their moves, I recommend to acknowledge it with all the enthusiasm of a cosplayer making contact with a sweaty fan. For example, the player claiming to be the Slayer has used their ability and no one has died. And that's all you're getting from me. Let them figure out why it did or did not hit their mark. Becoming a storyteller in Blood and Clock Tower can be rewarding, but you gotta go to school. You need to actually crack open those manuals, cook up a menu of roles, and juggle the behind the scenes. 
Thankfully, the Pandemonium Institute tossed us a bunch of interactive quizzes. It's like taking an online class, except you're cramming for game night. You have to be willing to put in a significant amount of work to actually understand the scripts and the rules and the game before the game begins. And it's not something a casual player would be willing to do or be able to do without significant preparation. But the reality is being the storyteller isn't like the administrator in Werewolf at all. That's a role where you watch as everyone else is having fun. There's real joy in being the third party to this dance of deception. But remember, it's not about your fun. You're the conductor of the fun train. If you're not all in in making everyone else's experience a blast, you might as well be taking a shit on the table. We have arrived at the big question in this video. Is Blood in the Clock Tower the best party game ever made? It's a stellar game, no doubt. Every roll tosses me into a web of deceit and discovery that's as addictive as hitting a snooze button with a morphine drip. But does it really sit on the peak throne of party games? Think about it. Starting with the definition of a party game. Board Game Geek puts it this way. Party games are games that encourage social interaction. They generally have simple setups and rules and they can accommodate large groups of people and play in a short amount of time. Seems pretty straightforward, right? But let's not skim the surface. Let's dive in together and really dissect on how Blood in the Clock Tower measures up against these party have criteria. High social interaction? Absolutely. Blood in the Clock Tower is all about social interactions. It's packed with more social interaction than the swingers party on Bliss Cruise. In Blood in the Clock Tower, you won't find yourself just staring at each other, trying to telepathically communicate. No, you'll be in deep discussions, debates, deductions, trusts, betrayal, alliances. It's like building a village where everyone's a suspect and the demon is just a pitchfork throws away. The game isn't just social deduction, it's social on steroids. If we're scoring this, it's a duh, 10 out of 10. It's incredibly social. Easy setup. For a game that's more loaded than a chicken with pickles in it, it's surprisingly manageable. Thanks to the Pandemonium Institute's obsession with polish, setting up and tearing down Blood in the Clock Tower is Astroglide smooth. Each script is neatly boxed like a set of Russian dolls, making organization of the tokens and reminders as easy as pie. But let's be real, it's not quite the open the box and play easy. Compared to the likes of Codenames, Monikers, or even Werewolf, it's kind of like comparing assembling IKEA furniture to unfolding a lawn chair. So on the ease of setup scale, I'm giving it a solid 9 out of 10, but it's not the easiest game in the world to set up. Large groups of people. Well, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Blood on the Clock Tower is an extroverted friend who's comfortable in groups about 7 to 15, plus the one storyteller. But throw it a curveball with five or six players and you're in Teensyville. A unique set of scripts that, let's be honest, doesn't quite hit the high notes like the standard ones. It's kind of like going on a date to Olive Garden and getting Arby's. Now, for the popular people out there who want to push past 15 players, enter the Travelers. These Travelers are kind of like your visiting cousins being guests at a party. Sometimes they add their own twist, other times they eat the dip with their fingers. I'm still on the fence about whether they add or detract from the experience. So technically, yes, the game can handle 6 to 21 players. But if we're talking about the sweet spot, it's more like 9 to 16 people required. That's a pretty decent sized party by most standards. But if we're comparing it to games like Codenames, which can seamlessly grow from a cozy gathering to a small mob, it's a different story. So for accommodating large groups, Blood in the Clock Tower gets an 8.5 out of 10. It tries its absolute best, but I think it plays best about uh, 10 to 15 players with the storyteller. Short amount of time. Here's where Blood in the Clock Tower might stumble as a party game. If we're talking party games, it's kind of like bringing Lord of the Rings Extended Edition for date night instead of a fast rom-com. An average game with 10 players runs about an hour, give or take. That's assuming everyone isn't engrossed into their web of lies and deceit that they lose track of time, which is a common occurrence to be honest. It's kind of part of the charm for them to take a while in the day phase. And compared to other top tier party games that wrap up in a brisk 30 minutes, Blood in the Clock Tower is more like chunky. 
It's not a mark against the game's quality, it's just that in the world of quick and breezy party games, it's the one that leisurely is strolling through the park. For meeting the short amount of time criterion, I'd say it's like a 6 out of 10. It's kind of like a guest who overstays at the party, but you don't really mind because they're so entertaining. Simple rules. Oh boy, buckle up, friendos. Let's talk about the complexity of Blood on the Clock Tower. It's a fantastic game, but when it comes to a party game, it's kind of like bringing Zodiac Killer Ciphers to Bingo Night. Board Game Geek's community seems to be on the same page, rating it a 2.98 in complexity. To put that in perspective, the next contender in the top 100 party games is lounging around a comfy 2.20. Feed the Kraken slash Captain Sonar. The vast majority are chilling in the 1.0, 1.5, maybe creeping up to the 2.0 range. So having a meaty puzzle like this is an abnormality for the otherwise very light offerings in the list. It seems like Board Game Geek's voters, let's call them the gamer elite, have a soft spot for chunky, mind-bending puzzles. But the deal is Blood on the Clock Tower demands a dedicated storyteller, someone who's ready to dive headfirst into the deep end. And when it comes to the scripts, Trouble Brewing is pretty much the only one I would dare to introduce to non-gamers. Maybe until they played 10 or so rounds, then maybe we would crack open the other two. So in terms of simplicity, we're kind of looking at a 3 out of 10. This isn't a critique on the game itself, it's just that you probably don't want to bring this out on Grandma's Thanksgiving feast. So where do I land on this whole Blood on the Clock Tower being the number one game on BGG's party game list? Well, let's put it like this. The game is truly werewolf with hundreds of house rules, but it comes out all shiny, polished, and ready to impress. It is a dramatic success in what it tries to set out to do, which is take the core idea of werewolf and refine it. I'm eagerly eyeing the future for more scripts, ingenious twists from the Pandemonium Institute. The community is already tinkering with the experimental roles, and there's new scripts often online for you to use. I can't wait to dive into these new scripts with future games with friends, and my overall rating is a thunderous 9.8 out of 10. One of the best games I've ever played. But let me put it this way, I don't think it's the best party game for most people. You need a group that's willing to dive in, and Blood on the Clock Tower is at its absolute best when everyone knows the depth of the script how to bluff certain roles, and even where there is a group meta. This takes time and a willingness to learn and teach people in a natural way. To put it differently, it's not like your approachable party game like Codenames or Monikers, where you can explain the rules while you microwave the popcorn and everyone gets it. It doesn't even have the instant accessibility of other social deduction games like the brilliant Avalon. Blood in the Clock Tower is not a good party game for people who don't usually play games. And let me reiterate this, Blood on the Clock Tower isn't the best party game for the vast majority of people who want to play a party game. It's the party game that's best for board gamers. The ones who analyze their Euro games, can endure the epics of their war games, and who thrive on bluffing and strategizing. Blood on the Clock Tower is a deep game that has a real learning curve. It's not a difficult curve, but it's the most difficult that I can think of for a party game. That's why it's ranked numero uno on the Board Game Geek top party games. The audience of the website, of course, gravitates to those meaty games. It's like the board gamer's party game, not a party gamer's party game. And that's why I'm right there with them with my rating of 9.8. Thank you.